All right, are we ready? Welcome to the Bcash FS BOF. First overview, what, like, who's this thing targeted at and what's it do, feature set. Bcash FS is targeted at everything. Phones all the way up to servers. Uh, we've got people running it on uh, servers of well over 100 terabytes so far. Features, eventually all of them. We've already got most of them. Project priorities. Right now, the big focus is on hardening. Lots and lots of hardening, error injection, debugability, uh, lots of work on repair. Uh, later on, after we're done with hardening, we're gonna start to work more on performance. And then after, after performance, then we're gonna get back to features. Not doing feature work right now, except with a, with a few exceptions. What should I do? Just want to jump in. I've done this before. Uh, I've recently posted a coding style document for how, how I want uh, development done in BcacheFS. Uh, a couple key areas. Assertions intro and introspection and just or organization. Those are the big focuses. Uh, we do not do the Kristoff thing of deleting assertions. Assertions are documentation that cannot get out of date. Uh, I don't want to be seeing two-week bug hunts. I've seen way too many of those in my career, like, like, like I already mentioned earlier in, in the conference. I don't want to see people headbutting over bugs uh, or getting frustrated. If there is a difficult bug, that's when we go adding assertions, adding new introspection, or just talking in the channel, asking for help. Uh, that's been a big focus for a long time and it has really paid off in a big way. I, <sighs> development has been going pretty damn smoothly over the past several years and I wanna see that continue. I wanna, I wanna teach people how we do things. <sighs> Other big focus for the year is I'm spending a lot of time on just building up an effective team. Uh, over the past 10 years, I have spent most of my time just hiding away writing code. I'm not writing all the code anymore. Uh, Thomas from Lanel uh, has started doing some great work. Uh, we've got other people, Ariel out in uh, Cisco in Europe. Uh, Brian Foster has been doing some really helpful debugging. A lot of people have been getting involved and I really want to do what I can to help people get productive, spend time talking to each other. Uh, I want to see a good exchange of ideas. And I want to see people learning from each other. And I'm going to go down a long list of features and kind of give people an idea of where things are at and where, the, where people can jump in and what to expect. Actually, before the feature status, a big focus is getting Rust into the kernel. I, I, we need to be planning for the future. I don't want to be writing in all my code in C 10, 20 years from now. Rust makes our lives so much easier. I don't like getting yanked off of my current project to go debug code that I should be done with. So we need to be, we need to be on top of this and we're the, we're the people who should be planning ahead and not, not waiting. So right now what we're doing with Rust is getting the debugFS interface rewritten in Rust. Uh, the code for that is, is pretty close to ready. We're made, mainly waiting on the VFS interfaces. <coughs> Once that's merged, that's non-critical. Uh, people can build without it, but that will start, start to shake out tool chain issues. So that's, that still has a ways to go with Rust, but we need to find out where we're at and how big of a pain point that is for people. The B-Tree transaction layer is, we've already got that most, that most of that available in Rust. We just need the update interface. Once that's done, and once we know that we can ship kernels with Rust enabled, we can start file by file 
redoing things in Rust uh, as we as we see fit. And I am really looking forward to that. Uh, we already have a good chunk of code in user space using the same B-tree transaction layer rewritten in Rust. And that code looks nice. I, I demoed that at the last Rust for Linux conference out in Spain. The Rust version of the list B-tree uh, debug tool is like half the size of the C version. It's, it's nice. Bouncing around a bit, going um, introspection tools. Uh, one of the things I see a lot in kernel land is a bit of hostility towards adding introspection, adding observe. I was just going to, just going to stop you. Uh, just go back to the Rust before you move on to the introspection. Yeah, stuff. yeah. Um, one of the questions I have is that if the BTFS. Uh, uh, the BKFS code uh, moves to Rust really quickly. Is that going to cause a problem for things like distros and so on building their kernels because they won't have the 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 Rust infrastructure in their kernel build packages and so on probably for some time. So is that going to cause uh, you a, an issue for distro level integration and so on? Yes, uh, Neil's the person to to talk to about that. It can. Yeah. And, and that's part of why I'm trying to get this done sooner rather than later. I understand. I just wanted to get a wider Yeah. I don't want to drop this on the distros after they already have this rolled out in the distro installer and they find out, oh shit, the next kernel release has to have Rust enabled and they have to figure it out. Otherwise, their, their users are left out in the cold. Yeah. So. Um, right now, I build and maintain two, dist uh, two distro kernels, one with Rust enabled and one without, because one of them ships a graphics driver written in Rust, and the other one doesn't have it, so I don't need it. But um, currently, the challenge is the Rust for Linux infrastructure has pieces of the Rust standard library vendored inside of the kernel tree, which means that we are hard locked to specific versions of the Rust compiler. And um, while they're this, in 6.10, they have merged, they just merged the patch to remove the last bits of that. One of the things that got actually slipped in in 6.8 was vendoring in some data strings for the, the, the bitstream format for, X8, uh, for Rust binary construction from LLVM into the code. So now you have issues depending on whether the Rust C was compiled with a version of, with a different version of LLVM. So while we no longer have the problem of the st Rust standard library being in there, we now have a problem where we have an indirect dependency now causing the whole kernel build to fail. Um, this is something that I, I, for, I don't even really understand why we have parts of the LLVM bitstream like in vendored now into the kernel for Rust, but that's a whole separate problem to figure out. Um, the, I think we're probably going to see by the end of the year, I mean, if everything goes as crossing fingers, um, we'll be at a point where Miguel will be able to decide that we can go from exact versioning to MVS versioning for the Rust compiler, so minimum version sets, mm -hmm. um, for those who don't know what that means. Um, and if once we start having MVS, then I can forward my patches for turning on, at least in the Fedora kernel, the Rust infrastructure and start looking at it. Um, but right now, I, as things currently stand right at this moment, I don't have the confidence that we will see a distro that um, cares about making sure that their um, kernel builds are maintainable, um, turning it on before maybe mid-2025. So uh, I guess closely related question, I mean, I like Rust and I'm definite, definitely excited to be writing more Rust, but um, couldn't you argue that um, incorporating and potentially rewriting large swaths of the code in Rust is contrary to the goal of hardening? Can you comment on that a little bit? The, the code that I'm looking, we won't be rewriting everything at Rust. Like we won't, won't be rewriting core B-tree code or core journal code in Rust anytime soon. Maybe 10 years down the line, we can start to think about that. 
Uh, the code that I'm looking at rewriting in Rust is things like fscheck.c, allocbackground.c. We have a lot of code that just interfaces to the B-tree transaction layer uh, and is nice and modular. And uh, we'll, we'll see real benefits. Uh, proper lifetimes, uh, proper types are going to, uh, we will see bugs shake out in code that we thought was done and bug free. Uh, and also, having a, a language with proper generic data structures, that code is going to get smaller and cleaner uh, and easier to work with. And we've got good tests. Uh, it's going to be low risk to do that a file at a time. I, one thing that I'd say about that is there will be some turbulence as you're transitioning, but I think once the transition is 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 done, um, then then things will be um, better, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, it's it's going to be a long, ongoing thing. Uh, it's. I would love to be diving in and working on that with most of my time right now, but I've got higher priority stuff, and it's hard to say how long that will be the case. Uh, hoping to get Thomas working more on, on some. Yeah. Our, the big gating thing really is uh, the VFS interfaces. Once that is in, I'm hoping that that will go smoothly enough that we can get it done in the background. Yeah, I'd like to add one thing about the, the status of, of, of the Rust support. I'm actually one of the maintainers with, with Miguel of, of, of the whole thing. Um, and, and as you said, we merged. The, so this, the, the problem we had of the vendor uh, libelog is, is gone, right? Um, we have a patch series that, that uh, removed that. Um, I, I actually don't know the, the thing you're talking about, about the, the LLVM um, bitstream thing. I actually don't know what, what so that is. What, what happened was that for the rebuilding on X86, it's not recorded, so it's only if you speak out loud enough, then I can definitely speak loud enough. <laughs> um, but since I have the microphone already, whatever. Um, so for x86, so this doesn't affect ARM. The only reason I, d I caught this is because I actually built all the Asahi kernels for both x86 and ARM as a sanity check to make sure I didn't break anything. And I found out that all of my x86 builds got split across Fedora releases evenly into succeeding and failed, which makes no sense since the Rust C is exactly the same across all the releases. The difference was, Half of the releases were on LLVM 17, and the other half were on LLVM 18. And the error was that there was this little string thing that's like from LLVM that is copied in and had to change um, as part of updating to Rust 178 as the as the min, as the new version that it was compatible with. I mean, I can show you the logs or whatever, and and we can talk about it, but like, it basically, there's a little bit of piece of LVM stuff that we now include, and that signature hasn't changed for ARM yet, so it hasn't affected us. It's actually included for what it's worth, for all architectures config us turns on, uh, it works on, but the issue is that for x86, it changed between LVM versions, but it didn't change for ARM, so I didn't see it there. Um, if it had not changed at all, I probably wouldn't have known that we were even doing this at all. Okay, moving on. Uh, repairability. The, the goal there is no matter how your file system gets trashed, I don't care whose fault it is, FS check should always bring it back. If there is, thing, if, if there is data on there to recover, we will get it back. And we are basically there. All that's missing there is uh, getting the error injection tooling uh, going that Thomas uh, just did and methodically going through every last uh, repair path of uh, automated tests. But the coverage that we've got just from users so far, that stuff is basically done. A uh, couple months back, I was working overtime on repairing a file system from a user in India who uh, accidentally wiped one drive out of a three drive file system with no replication on the family computer. So really wanted that data back. And we got the, the B-Tree node scan tool. I, that was code that I written years ago and didn't realize, didn't expect would be needed. Dusted that off, and now that's working well. And most recently, we now have in the superblock a 64-bit bitmap of regions of each device that have B-tree nodes, 
So if we do need that, we're not going to be waiting all day scanning the device. That's for extreme scenarios. Uh, anything sane, uh, if, unless you're, that, that's only if you're missing interior B tree nodes. Anything sane, the normal FS check repair paths should always just work. Uh, Derek has mentioned gaps in the transactional behavior of like E2FSCK. Uh, I think we can outdo even uh, EXD4 and XFS in robustness. Uh, EXD4, like, in my experience, sets a high bar, high bar there. I remember when I was in the early days of de developing Bcash, uh, I tested that quite thoroughly by losing my right back cache. And E2 FSCK always got my file system back uh, after, sometimes after many hours. But I aim, aim to test uh, Bcache FS repairability even more thoroughly. Uh, we should just about be at the point where you can light all your metadata on fire except for extens uh, leaf nodes and durance leaf nodes and recreate everything else and you will get all your files back in their proper place. If you, if you wipe your INO's B tree, your I size will be slightly off, you lose permissions, timestamps, ownership, but you'll still have all your data. Uh, blowing away all alloc info, that's tested by the uh, automated tests. So, and, and we're ramping up on all the other corner cases with error injection. Uh, I have a test that does uh, targeted destruction, uh, the kill B tree node test, and there's a mount option uh, which I need to hide better because a user found it on his file system that was over 100 terabytes that literally just blows away all your alloc info and recreates it. That, yeah, the, the trouble there is that we do most of that before going full read write. So we do updates before we've gone read write by appending those keys to the array of keys for journal replay to do. So if your file system is too big, you can only vmalloc a two gigabyte array. So that's one of the big motivations for online FS check, which is one of my big projects for this year. Uh, online FS check is around halfway, maybe two thirds of the way done. And getting the main uh, check alloc info pass online, I've, I'm a good chunk into that too. Uh, anything else? Any other questions on repairability, robustness? Just, just on the uh, you know you're blowing away nodes, things like that. When with like XFS and EXT4 and so on, when we when we uh, you know blow away you know individual parts of the file system, we can generally recover that without too much problem. We can rebuild allocation B trees from the free space scans that we've done and all of that sort of thing. So we can blow away those trees and repair. Mm -hmm. So they're the, the the relatively simple cases. The the ones that uh, become really interesting are the users that have had some kind of problem with their storage and so the storage is randomly corrupted at some yeah, point. Yeah. I've um, got a lot of meta and, dumps and, like and, that. And like I mean something that we see uh, a couple of times a year is a, an MD RAID uh, device that has been reassembled incorrectly and so at a 64k <laughs> offset a stripe all the way through the volume and then another one you know 128k off they've been swapped and so random metadata throughout the file system has been corrupted yeah um, and when we you know and the user is reporting because you know the file system reported corruption run repair they've run repair and repair has gone oh my god there's corruption everywhere and essentially gone i can't fix this and started moving stuff to lost and found and basically you know the file system is completely unintelligible at the time that repair is run what uh, what sort of testing from what well Two questions in that. Um, because you're not running on MD, you're unlikely to have that sort of failure mode. No, but there's in still storage. some problems. 
So the first question is, can that sort of failure mode occur in uh, a, a BKHFS setup, a multi-disc BKHFS setup? And B, if that sort of widespread corruption does happen, how are you testing for that and how well do you get repair you know, in those situations? How, what, how effective is repair in those situations? So, so far, a lot of the testing has been done by uh, collecting bug reports from users and having them send me a metadata dump, and then I work on uh, repair on my own time. Uh, I, I got one really fun uh, report from a user that sent me a dump of his six drive file system that had all kinds of corruption. And at first, I was looking for a bug in the bcachefs code because it was like every single B tree node had, or not every, but a lot, had uh, CRC errors maybe two thirds of the way through the node. Nodes are log structures, so maybe the first part was fine, but then. And then I finally noticed it was only two drives out of the six drive array. It was just those two drives. And apparently it had a power failure while the system was suspended. And that tickled something on those drives. And I think something that we want to look at there is uh, making it possible to recover from a previous checkpoint in the journal. Uh, if we start seeing a lot of corruption like that, just back up a little bit in the journal. And there's, there's only a few things that we would need to tweak to make that possible and log in the journal where that's possible. Uh, as far as more thorough automated testing, that's Thomas's tool, and that's also, like you were saying, Sysbot. Uh, the Sysbot bug reports that we've been seeing. Uh, yeah, yeah. But actually, pretty much all of them have been uh, small, easy to fix uh, gaps in our verifiers. Uh, nothing. Nothing interesting going on, just uh, missing test coverage. And I'm, I'm hoping to cover that all that with our own automated tests and get more creative there, like injecting bitters with interesting, like Gaussian error distributions in the B tree node. And we've already got, like, I think you've got the ability to add one to a field or set a field to all zeros in an individual B key field. Uh, and I've got automated code coverage analysis in the CI, so we'll be looking at that and aiming to get. I mean, you, you never ha hit 100% code coverage analysis, but yeah. as much as we can. Yeah. And just you know, looking at interesting bug reports and responding to mm -hmm. them as best we can, trying to get the most out of every bug report. Yeah, so I'll note that the one thing that I found that is most common on a non-RAID system that causes FSCK to have to spend a lot of time on EXP4 file systems is uh, when one portion of the inode table gets written to the wrong location on disk. So it's basically a write command where the LBA has a bit flip, flip somewhere. And so it overwrites another portion of the inode table. And before we added checksum support, yeah, yeah. essentially what ended up happening was we would have a whole large number of lots that got claimed by multiple inodes. Actually, it was the same inode, but the inode was written to the wrong place in the inode table. And so, you know, there would be, you know, a whole series of inodes uh, ranging from A to B to A plus N to B plus N that were, you know, blocks claimed at the same time. Um, yeah. So that is, you know, one of those things that you're looking for things to test seems to be, you know, if you're going to have I.O. failures, that seems to happen a fair amount, is the blocks just get written to the wrong location. Now, if you have checksums, it's not as big of a deal because you just reject it as, you know, this is nonsense. Yeah. And, uh, you know, assuming the checksums actually have the block number mixed into it. That, that actually is, though, the one thing that we're missing in our metadata headers is the LBA that we thought we wrote that that structure to. Uh, we've got everything else for like reconstructing B tree nodes. We've got the key, the min key for, that that node covers, a sequence number. So if we've got duplicate nodes, we know which one is bigger. Uh, and we naturally have metadata check something. But if I, if I can find a way to cram it in, getting that LBA in so that we can tell the user what actually happened and how their drives are corrupting their data, that's something that I'd really like. Yes, yeah, so, so that's something that XFS does. It puts the UUID of the file system and the, and the yeah, LBA. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's not just uh, <laughs> a, a mis 
placed a misdirected write within the file system. It's a mis misdirected write from another block device to a file system. And we've seen both of those sorts of failures, um, you know, in, especially in SAN, SAN arrays and stuff like that, where you've got maybe thousands of LUNs being exported to, to other things, and the SAN array is actually writing blocks to the wrong LUNs. Um, <laughs> and so there's no corruption in your system, you know, in the OS that you're running that's using that LUN, some other, you know, it's, machine it, writing to some other LUN has terrifying. overwritten your, co your we, file system, so. We that, do XOR yeah. the file system UUID into the magic number for, like, B-tree node headers and journal headers. Yeah. okay. Uh, so you've got some protection there for yes. that situation. Yeah. RiserFS famously, they needed to use their B-tree reconstruct tool fairly often, and they did not have anything that identified their nodes with that particular file system. So the repair tool would pick up nodes from if you had a loopback file system. Yes. Yeah. A well-known failure. Yeah. Don't Amusing wanna... failure, but yes. <laughs> um, Memorable. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think that probably covers repairability. I wanted to quickly scan down uh, feature list status, and if things are interesting, we'll go in, more, uh, in depth more. Snapshots are working really well. Uh, Red Hat recently did some more uh, performance testing of snapshots, got up to a thousand snapshots in our worst case scenario, which is uh, th they were doing file random writes to simulate a database or a VM workload where you've got many, many overwrites, and they said at a thousand snapshots, it was just fine. Uh, FS check scales, uh, all the FS check algorithms are order number of keys, not order of sub volumes. So you can have as many snapshots as you want, and FS check will be just fine. Uh, erasure coding is commonly asked for. Uh, it is still marked as experimental. The code is essentially complete, but it needs. Uh, focused attention from someone to torture test the crap out of it, probably go through and look for just final polish. Uh, erasure coding is really cool. ZFS does erasure coding by fragmenting incoming writes. Uh, ButterFS still has the RAID hole. Uh, we do not fragment our writes and we have no RAID hole because we take advantage of the fact that we're, we're copy on write. Uh, foreground writes are initially replicated. We accumulate full stripes. When we have a full stripe, we write out the P and the Q, and then we drop the extra replicas to have the stripe pointer. And we have a cool optimization where if a journal flush doesn't happen, we'll reuse those buckets right away, and they only cost bus bandwidth. So i make a quick note here. You said that ButterFS still has the write hole. Well, that is sort of true for some of the modes. The RAID modes have been gradually being rewritten to use erasure coding as well. That has been in progress for about a year now um, because when they introduced zone storage support, they basically had to yoink all of the RAID code and start over. That, and so that that's that, so it's all erasure coding based. Yeah, you need to do that stuff right if you're doing zone device support. Yeah, right. So we now do use erasure coding for almost every RAID mode um, except for the five, six modes, which are now disabled if you use, if you have the erasure coding code turned on while that's being plumbed in. Okay. And I believe you talked to Johanna's just outside. Yep. Yep. And I think the idea is that we're going to attempt to share erasure coding stuff between the two, and then maybe I, we can get I a think stronger that beat down on that. But he, I, I pointed out my code, and I'll, I'll be happy to answer questions, and if you want to pour over algorithms together. Yeah, I think as a one of the consequences of that is we'll probably start having shared beatdowns of the erasure coding stuff um, to make sure that everything is uh, much more solid. But like yeah. uh, ButterFS also has erasure coding stuff. It's just not finished across yeah. all the modes yet. Yeah, um, scanning down the list. Online FS check. Uh, unlike other file systems, we do not have a separate code base for FS check. It's the same FS check whether it's in kernel or user space. And it's the same FS check that we're making online, just making it fully transactional and adding locking where, where needed. Uh, once online FS check is done, there will be no reason to run online FS check unless you want to run it in user space for debu debugging it. Uh, even if you lose your allocation information, we'll be do it online FS check by doing a quick pass over your metadata to mark out uh, the buckets no use bitmap. 
which is normally only allocated for the migrate tool. And then after bucket snow use is initialized, we'll go free, full read write and do the rest of FS check in the background. Uh, send and receive is also very frequently asked for. I have not started on that, but I have been sketching out the design and I'm hoping to get someone working on that soon. Uh, we will also be doing synchronous send and receive, hanging up, uh, hang off the journal layer with RDMA, and I have some cool uses of that in mind. Uh, and we've been talking to Lustre people. I think that might dovetail nicely with, with their needs. Uh, SquashFS type tool. In case you can't tell, one of my big motivations is to, we have a lot of fragmentation in the file system space, a lot of people doing special purpose file systems. I am not trying to finish everything myself, but I'm trying to prove out different features and different aspects of the design and make sure everything works so other people can pick off and continue and not have to do something from scratch. Uh, SquashFS, instead of having to have separate file systems for eReoFS and SquashFS, uh, if we'd have a tool to just build up maximum size compressed accent, maximum size B tree nodes, drop allocation information, drop the journal. I think we're going to be competitive or better than SquashFS and eReoFS in terms of uh, file system size. Microphone. On an empty BcacheFS file system with no journal, what's well, how much space does that actually take up? Just uh, we haven't looked yet. Uh, someone's written the initial uh, create and an image tool. Uh, he hasn't done the cool optimizations yet. He's looking at the Btree node and merge code, and I'm going to be answering questions about that when I get done with the conference. Okay. So yeah, we won't have numbers on that for a couple months. Uh, but there's cool optimizations in the low-level low B-tree code. I, I would be shocked if we can't do better than SquashFS and eReoFS. Uh, Lustre, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, there's cool things happening in the Lustre's, uh, Lustre space. They're also talking about upstreaming, which I, there, apparently there's a whole effort, and Neil Brown is helping out, and I'm telling them they need to post to FS develop sooner rather than later. So I think interesting things might come out of there. Uh, F-sync reduction, I'm going to leave that for a different time to talk about, but I think there's a lot of fun things we can do to get rid of F-sync overhead. Actually, maybe I will. Uh, we already have O temp file. If a file is a temp file, it's getting deleted if we crash. There's no reason for FSync to do anything, so we already turned that into a no op. Uh, I'm planning to add uh, temp dir support, same deal, where we delete the contents uh, in recovery. That means the for any any file in that temp dir, FSync can be a no op. So you could use that for slash temp if for some reason you don't want to use a temp FS, or applications can use that for their own private directories. Uh, Yep, yep. The only case where I think that that might get squirrely is package managers because they do backwards operations for installs and upgrades and stuff like that. No, but package managers are in the same boat of they really care about ordering more than, more than this thing needs to be on the platters now. Uh, and using F-Sync for everything is, is not the, the right approach. We also need an F-Sync to syscall with a flags argument so we can specify, is this just for ordering? Do we just need to write the pages out and write the inode out? Or do we need to actually flush the journal? Yep, I've been talking to people about that. So I'm involved in little bit, and this is In RPM a little bit, and in, in the RPM space, we've been trying to tackle making it less on I.O. when doing transactions. And right now we have the big hammer of not, no opting F-Sync, but that's really not the right thing to be doing, and which mm -hmm. is why it's off by default. You don't, you don't want to no op F-Sync. Um, it would be nice if we had more granularity there to, to 
to do smarter things depending on the storage I, and stuff I was, like that. I was talking to some people who are saying that dpackage is even worse and uh, yeah, it is much dpackage worse. wears SSDs out. Uh, for dpackage uh, and also for build servers, uh, I've been sketching out a oh, whole file only where if the entire file isn't written out and it's been closed, we just delete it and recover it. I think that would be a natural extension of the, yeah, the stuff. That would, that would be a tremendous boost, especially for things like compilation, because then yep. all the yep. uh, object unit uh, fragments can just get poofed away. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, I'll note the other thing, if you're going to have an F-Sync flag, it would be um, an F-Sync flag that indicates I only care about this file, right? So technically speaking, the only thing POSIX guarantees when you call fsync is the file that you call fsync on is forced to disk and will, you know, be there uh, after even an, uh, a crash. However, um, we explicitly decided when we were implementing ext4 fast commits to implement a stronger version of fsync because that's what all of the other file systems do, which is if, when you call fsync, everything um, gets written. Everything gets written, and you know other metadata operations that may have happened alongside of the file being fsync are in fact you know committed because they're all part of the transaction log. Yeah, and, and we did that because nobody wanted to make another syscall for it. Well, right, and we were tempted to just simply have fsync only guarantee the file that you fsync because that's all the POSIX specification guarantees. Right. Uh, and I said, I'm afraid somebody will get screwed if I did that. And so yeah. we did the conservative thing. But if we're gonna have fsync flags, we're, we're, it'd be nice if one of the fsync flags is, you know, bare minimum, you know, just this file. I, I'm, I don't see how that would fit in. If we're flushing the journal, we're not gonna flush the journal out of order. And if we're not flushing in the order, that's the, yeah, that's the lightweight version that we're already going to add. Well, so if you have some sort of commit strategy that allows you to uh, only commit that file yeah. but not uh, any uh, other changes, yeah. right? Which unordered we with uh, that commits. Say again? Unordered commits. Yeah. Um, so that, that's not something we do in XFS. It's all strictly ordered metadata yeah, and so on. I'm, and B, BKFS is very similar. You know, yeah. If you commit at this point, everything that's happened in the past yeah. is also committed. That's just the nature of way the way the, the, the journaling works. Um, but the thing is that uh, the, the POSIX requirement is that after an F-sync, the data that has been F-synced must be able to be accessed. Yep. And so that actually implies that if you've just created the file and then you write some data to it and you F-sync it, that file creation, the parent directory, all the changes to that has to be written as well because you have to be able to find the file after it's recovered. So you have an actual, you can't just, FSync can't just say write this data only because if that file was just created, we still have to FSync the changes to the directory that were made as well. So okay. uh, BKFS and, and XFS get around that because we've got that strictly ordered yep. Yep. Um, behavior. It doesn't matter how far in the past the, the creation occurred, if it's still active in memory, it will get flushed to the journal with the changes to, for accessing the data. Um, the fast commit stuff, you had to extend that to be able to commit the uh, parent inode in that exactly. situation. Um, but the problem is, is if we have file only, we then, in, in that particular case, you still have to sync the directory structure, oh. otherwise you can't get to the data. Yeah, no, um, we do that. So, we, we yeah, but no, but yeah. the uh, the if you have like a soft update style thing, yeah. you could do this too, yeah. right? But the, my, <laughs> yeah. my comment was the, yeah. if the the flag that you were suggesting, which is file only, so it only guarantees the data it well, gets yeah, the disk. Yeah. You, you, you still have that. You still have to solve that problem. And, yes. Um, and, the the woods, then, right? Pardon? You would have to go all the way to the woods. For, mm -hmm. Yeah. If there yeah. were any directories that were created, you have to make sure that that. Yeah. There, there, there's an ancestor relationship yes. uh, in that, and the the ancestor relationship in BKFS and XFS is done via the strict ordering of all the metadata yeah. updates. Do we have a potential problem if you skip FSync on temp files? 
because I think there are places where temp file is created, you write stuff into it, you do f-sync, and then you do link to make it available. Do we that's the same inode. Yeah, we, we, f-sync we, is on the inode, not... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We, we talked about that yesterday. Um, in that situation, you can ignore the f-sync as, as long as you tag the <laughs> inode to say, if this gets linked into the directory structure, either yeah. via yeah. link at or some of the other things we were talking about, um, the rename stuff yesterday, yeah. um, if that flag is set on the inode to say that it, it ignored an f-sync, that operation then needs to do the yeah, f-sync before yeah. it operate, yeah. runs the link. So it effectively becomes ignored except if. Yeah. Um, so deferred yeah. f-sync. Specifically you talked about because of package manager and overlay FS yeah. weirdness. All right. So what I have sketched out in the feature list for anything, there's zone device support. Uh, because, bu because allocation in bcachefs is bucket-based, buckets are intended to map to zones. So for user data and the journal, zone device port is trivial. The remaining piece there is the way B-tree nodes work doesn't quite map, so we need to do delayed allocation and always write out the whole B-tree node. Uh, that would be a fun project for anyone who wants to learn the B-tree code, or if I get to it, it'll be like in a year or so. Shrink would be a great starting project for, for anyone else uh, because we have all the infrastructure for that. Eva um, evacuate bucket for copy GC. Uh, and we do need a free in inodes B tree, and that is the only remaining scalability work that I know of for, for a good long time. Uh, the free inodes B tree, that was actually about an evening to write. The reason I didn't merge it is because then we hit lock contention on the free inodes B tree. So we also need something analogous to AGI as an XFS, but lighter weight. Uh, say again, which, which sharding? I thought uh, a while back when I was running some of the uh, file create benchmarks, this is going back a couple of years ago, probably, yeah. um, there was significant contention on the inode tree doing concurrent allocation and you made some changes to shard the, I think it was the inode space, not so much yeah, the B-tree, okay. so for, the keys were the inodes B-tree themselves, yeah. uh, we've got the B-tree key cache. Yeah. And I think that was after snapshots had been merged, and I had to disable the key cache for inodes for a while because there are some fun interactions with uh, inodes lookups and, and filter snapshots uh, in B-tree iterator mode, but that's, that's now re-enabled. So specifically on the free inodes B-tree, that's different. Uh, we ne need to enforce that there are certain leaf node boundaries, and that wouldn't be so, so hard to do. But uh, because B tree nodes are currently 256K by default, that will waste a ton of RAM. Mm -hmm. So I want to do variable size B tree node buffers. And that's just some tedious refactoring and going through and changing everything that reference a B tree node buffer size. Uh, but nothing, nothing technically interesting. Mm -hmm. And that's about all I got. So, what else are people interested in? There's a lot of other features that I haven't talked about. David, you might be interested in using bcachefs code or for Cash what you're link. doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was wondering, uh, one thing I was wondering, if it's a really small amount of data, if you don't have a journal attached, could we use it as a replacement for swap file, a swap file format? <laughs> uh, probably. Swap files suck because of the MM code, not because of the file <laughs> system code. <laughs> well, it, it, <laughs> yeah, it's just with, with the upcoming requirement to cache potentially huge multi-page folios. 
Yeah, so are we thinking like a cut down version of the, the Bcache of SB tree yeah, code? We don't care about, or if it's just full, we don't care about persistence. Yeah, yeah, because you want to run without the journal, which is not something that we normally have any desire to do. Yeah. So, so what you, you're coming back to having a key value store in a file system for yeah yeah so so is it, so is it just a database basically yeah so so basic um, who was I talking to I think I was talking to Joseph about this basically what you're after is uh, a file descriptor based um, interface that is get keys or get, you know um, you know set key value get Get key value, remove key value, <coughs> and so on. Which you know, you, you do key value, well, drop, yeah, yeah. drop, yeah. Well, that's remove effectively, yeah. So I, I think yeah. what we'd want um, to and and so we were we we were thinking that that would actually be relatively easy to do as a file descriptor based thing, and then the file system that it f function goes through can attach to that file descriptor either uh, its own implementation of a key value store, whether it be a B tree, you know. Uh, one, one file descriptor per key value store. So, you know, so, 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 so but, what's that? So, yeah, per key value store. So you, the file descript, the, fi the, the file, the file descriptor tells yeah. the file system which, which database it's actually storing it in. Um, you know, and so like for XFS, we could do something like we just have an inode and use the attribute um, fork, which is a key value store per file descriptor. So maybe you could have a key value uh, B tree implementation and, you know. Yeah I, I, yeah, I think the first thing we should do is just get something quick and dirty hooked up. Don't even bother flipping off the journal. Just get something yeah. working and see how well it performs and profile it. Yeah, because the other thing that I can do is re re uh, write an alternative FS cache backend. Well, I, th I think it's exactly what you want for FS cache because we have native support for caching all the way through. Like yeah. the allocator understands the concept of buckets that have cache data and it will do LRU. It will drop uh, the oldest bucket with cache data when it needs new free buckets. I, I, I think it's exactly what you want. Yeah, I would index This sounds like we're going back to Bcache and building up something else for it. like. It, it sure feels like that's that's what's happening here. Not, yeah. not, re not really. It depends. I mean, essentially, all that a file system is is a bunch of database tables of sure. key value yep. stores. What's free space? It's a key value store. What's yep. you know? Yeah. What's an inode table? It's a key value store. Sure. Um, so. uh, sure yeah, XFS uses B trees to index them. Um, BKFS uses B trees to index them. EXT4 uses bitmaps and tables to to index them. But fundamentally, they are just Key yeah. value stores. Well, see what Microsoft tried to do was in the uh, early 2000s, an SQL based thing. Yeah. Yeah, re is, re -FS. yeah. Uh, no. REFS. REFS, yeah. WinFS, whatever you yeah. call it. But then you've right. got yeah, a database in the kernel as a file system, that's yeah. a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just they used an SQL, in, wanted to use an SQL interface yeah. instead of a. Yeah, that would that's that's way too heavy. But the other the other thing about doing a file system as a database is that historically, file systems have had a lot of like per inode sharding and AGI sharding, mm. because it was not. I, I think before it was done, it was not ever immediately clear that you could do a like one one extens B tree for the entire file system and have it scale properly. Bcache was what proved that idea out to me, and there was a lot that went into that. Like log structured Btree nodes turned out to be the best idea ever for entirely different reasons that than my I did my original idea was for. Uh, and so, so what I'm trying to say there yeah. is, I think the solution to your problem is actually a native key value store interface. Oh, yeah, in yeah, yes, that's and what then, I was looking for. And then just let the but file systems do <coughs> what they need to do to implement. Yes, that. exactly. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. what I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah. But don't don't write a B tree fr from scratch. As far as I know, the Bcache FS B tree is the fastest ordered persistent key value store in ex in existence. I'm not joking. If you compare the micro, micro benchmarks, uh, the Bcache FS B tree to like the whole level DB lineage. It's not even close. Uh, we were doing some comparison way back in the day of like your 
RCUB tree. Yeah. And yours is faster, but not by a huge margin. Yeah, and and that didn't actually turn out to uh, to work in all situations. Um, you know, it, it did actually have some scalability problems in the end when you got to several hundred million records in the yeah. B tree. Um, yeah, I, I I can't understate the amount of scalability work that's gone into the B cache of SB tree. Like uh, we have on six locks have a a mode where read locks only bump a per CPU counter. That was done for sub volumes because we need locking for taking a snapshot. In other words, we have to lock the subvolume because that references the snapshot ID, but that means every single file system transaction is taking a lock on the same key. Even though it's in the key cache, we can't have them doing atomic operations on the same cache line. But that also fed into, we now use that for locks on interior B tree nodes, so we can have massive uh, B trees used by many different threads and they're almost always going to be doing uh, taking read locks on interior nodes. It scales amazingly well across cores. Sounds good. And, and, and that's, Sounds the, that, that's basically the same concept that the RCU B tree was based on, is that the used uh, per node uh, seek locks effectively for, for access mm -hmm, and determining mm -hmm. whether something was changed while you're doing a traversal. Uh, so, I mean, that concept works really, really well um, up to, you know, the problem I started having was when you get to tree depths of 20 to 30, um, that that no longer scales because of the overhead of doing, uh, you know, re-walking up the path, doing, uh, doing key updates yeah, um, yeah. and so on. And that then started to be the scalability limitation of it. But you're not getting to those sorts of depths in, in uh, BKFS. Because our nodes are much bigger. What's that? Because our nodes are much bigger. Yeah, yeah I was dealing with uh, 14, 14 record nodes. Um, so they're only like 256 bytes. Yeah. So I was doing in-memory stuff versus on-disk type things. Um, but once you get, you know, so you're not getting those depths, so it does, a, the, the actual algorithm scales really, really, really well. Um, and it's no surprise that it turns out to be pretty much the fastest you can, you can build for a file system or any real there's, database. There's actually yeah. more stuff we could do. Uh, the Eitzinger lookup code that the core look, uh, we use for lookups within a B-tree node, we can do better than that now because AVX 512 now has all the instructions that we need for paralyzing those lookups. Yeah. And to, to put that in context, the stuff that I was doing wasn't using any of those sorts of optimizations. It was just a straight linear, you know, traditional B-tree node style. Yeah, which, which so, is really interesting to me. Hmm. It's, it's interesting how... Like, Eitzinger is not what you would go with today, even, uh, even without AVX 512. But uh, I'm not going to change that because one of the, the key optimizations is having the function for converting from Eitzinger, uh, an Eitzinger node, to its position in, in an in order traversal. It took me two weeks of staring at binary tree traversals in binary to find that code, and I don't have a proof for why it works. <laughs> I'm not doing that for DRA trees. I, I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, question about uh, it, if I use it as a key value store, if you say, if I say here's a key, you say there's the value, can I just read a bit of that value or modify a bit of that value, or do I have to read or write the whole thing? <clears throat> so, again, do you have to read, write? Read or write the whole value. So uh, if, the whole value. Well, can I, can I just read if a part of it? Actually, if you're using it as a purely in-memory B-tree, mm. you could update the value in place. But yeah. that would pin the whole B-tree in memory yeah. because yeah. you have to obey the log-structured properties in order yeah. for it to get written out properly. And, and if I just read, want to read it, can I just read part of the value or do I have to read the whole value? Uh, we could do that. Um, yeah. general, so, for example, with, uh, with the Exatra yeah. you know, Im implementation, which XFS uses the, the key value B tree in the inode attribute for, yeah. that is, you know, there's no offset in length. We have to return the whole value. Yeah. We can't do a partial value update or yeah. anything of the sort like that because there's no offset length. It's just yeah. the entire record is what you get and what you, you, you operate yeah. on. So if we were to actually write a new you know, general interface for it, 
you know, we can do, we can yeah. provide offset length to do, you know, an, an update in place. Yeah. Um, well, more, there's more yeah. reading, I think, because with the, the cache, what I want to do is read a big chunk, say two megabytes from the server and store that on the disk. But then the application usually doesn't want all of that two megabytes. It might only want the first 4K. Okay, but so I don't want to read the whole... You, you won't be storing the so two megabytes in line with the B tree. Yeah. You will be having uh, an extent that has a pointer that points to some yeah. uh, some region of disk space, and you will use the normal allocation yeah. path. Yeah, it, it, it'd, okay. be done, it'd be done as a B plus tree rather than as a B right. star tree. Yeah. Um, so so uh, there, there's another layer of indirection to get those large values back. But right. that said, um, certainly with an, uh, the XFS implementation, we could return the first 4K if that's the, all the data that you need. So if you yeah. were to say offset zero length four, then we know exactly where that is on disk and we can just yeah. read that amount of data from it. Um, so for partial reads, that's not a problem. Partial writes, so yeah. uh, partial overwrites, um, that's more of a problem because we have to then look it back up to get a valid B tree cursor, and so yeah. there's yeah. there's um, time time of check to time of modify um, race conditions that yeah. we have so, to so deal I with. So I need to read yeah. in the entire thing, really modify it and write it back out. Yeah, so so you you need a cookie to say that this hasn't changed from the time you did the yeah. lookup to the time you go to the right, and then the update has to be able to handle being told, no, it's changed, you have to go and start your operation again. Yeah, I can cope with that, as long yeah. as I can get some memory to do it in. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, that's, no, you, that's your, your that, problem. That's no different from yeah. writing to the server and finding a well, you know, third-party modification now well, to load that. Make any, any sort of that. update is going to yeah. require memory because we're talking yeah. about B tree structures. Any, yeah, any yeah. modification. It could be quite a lot of memory, is what I was thinking. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Any any time you're talking about a file system and a B tree or a journaled operation or anything like that, you need memory. Um, oh, agreed. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Oh, agreed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Let's let uh, Ted uh, uh, do X4 a bit, uh, if that's okay. Um, One thing I didn't mention is timeline. Uh, things have been stabilizing really nicely. I have not been freaking out over bug reports like I was afraid I was in the run up to upstreaming. I'm estimating inside of a year this will be ready, ready for enterprise early adopters. No new, f new feature work within the, the next year. But just focus like, focusing on stabilizing and hardening, and it's, it's looking good. You went on record. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, six locks. Uh, any chance LockDep will be able to uh, 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 supports report on them? And uh, did you get any buy-in from ButterFS, XFS for some workloads, maybe? Are you still interested in six locks? Uh, six locks in XFS, we have to plumb them in into a couple of different locations, which we currently have just straight semaphores. Um, the biggest issue is those places we use semaphores because they're, we can't use owner tracking. We we use them across, we hold those locks across I.O. In, in essentially in exclusive mode. So that's how we ensure that there's no updates going on while it's being DMA'd to disk. Um, so I'm not sure that the six locks, if, especially if they've got lock depth trapping on them, we can't, you know, lock depth does not allow non-owner locks. I, I actually um, have lock depth tracking enabled for six locks right now, mm -hmm. and I need to turn it off because we will take more B tree node locks than lock depth can track. So mm -hmm. we'll be moving to just having one lock depth map for any B tree nodes locked. Yep. And that's the right model anyways, because we don't have a lock ordering between B tree nodes. We have yep. cycle detection. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that's basically the the you know we've got to go and change the 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 locks that you know and the way we use the locks the buffers are not uh, that these locks belong in are used for more than just B tree nodes. They're used for inode buffers. They're used you know it's the buffer yeah, case yeah. uses these. Um, so any metadata that's in buffers is using these objects. And so we. If we move those to six locks, then we've got to actually change the locking across the entire file system for the metadata to use six locks rather than semaphores. Um, so it's a bigger, pro bigger 
It's a larger scope than just use six locks in bee trees. That's what we use them for, but we've still got to then walk through the rest of the code base and update all the locking in that as well. So it's a fairly significant project. We're still that, interested that should in be it, mostly a search and replace, though, shouldn't it? Pardon? That should, shouldn't that be mostly a search and replace? <sighs> kind of, but, uh, you know, there's some intricate stuff done especially in the in the, okay. uh, the the freeing code and the reclaim code to do with dropping the last reference um, and the locking involved in that because well because reclaim um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, there's some interesting life cycle issues that we need to work through okay as we change the the lock model um, so it's not just a straight search and replace okay unfortunately all right. All right, let's go to XT4. So that was basically the primary discussion I knew I had. Um, like I said, we, we have a community video conference chat. Um, Derek is on there, and occasionally we will discuss other things like IOMAP and folio conversions, um, anything that uh, is affecting other file systems, what ends up happening is we chat at the XP4 call and we make sure that it shows up on FSML. Um, so I've actually found it really helpful to have those sorts of video chats. So I'm very really thankful that Derek and uh, Matthew Wilcox have been able to jump in. Um, we're lucky that we can manage the time zone so we can actually do the um, weekly uh, video chat. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll just mention that it's not necessarily only XP4 specific topics, although obviously anything that involves IMAP or other stuff, we have to make sure it gets uh, covered uh, in other form. Um, but yeah, I mean, I am actually wondering if it would be useful if there was interest in some sort of FSML um, video chat maybe once a month. And, you know, apologies to people who are, you know, on, on the you know, Asia Pacific time zones because it's going to suck. But uh, I just found the video chats to be super, super helpful. So, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. I'd love that because sometimes it, it seems like when we have particularly big cross FS discussions, it, it is really hard to kind of get the point across succinctly with the mailing list stuff. Yeah. And I know at least when I'm in Kent's Bcash Fest Cabal call to talk. And yes, it is actually called that. It is, it, that is what the name of the video call is. Um, it is a lot easier for us to get the point across and, yeah. and kind of resolve these little uh, difficulties and, and actually move forward faster. Yeah. So, so I would love to see one that's FS, FS develop wide. So, so, so. I'm just simply mentioning this back because there have been various IOMAP discussions with Giancarra. Yeah. So, I mean, the thing you've got to consider is that, like, BK Chefes stuff uh, and so on, that's 3 a.m. for me. Um, yeah, I know. So, so <laughs> it, it, when you have these sorts of calls that are friendly to Europe and the U.S., they are 3 a.m. to 4 a.m. for me is, is typical, and you won't see me on those calls at all. So, you know, you're not going, having those calls is not going to remove the need to run the, the mailing list gauntlet. Um, for review, because there are there are people that will not be able to make those calls who have opinions. <laughs> you don't always have to hold it at the same time. You can hold some earlier and some later. Yes, but in general, if you want to pick up all th three continents, you go early in the morning for Europe, which is late at night for that. Unfortunately, it's, still... it's round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So, so someone gets the short straw. Yeah.
um, which was kind of painful for everybody every other week. Um, and it kind of sucks, but yeah, I mean, that's the only way you do something like that. Uh, yeah. Is somebody, every once in a while, someone's going to have to do a super late call or, you know, yeah. <laughs> or someone agrees to take one for the team and be super, have to get up super early. That's what yeah. I did for or, one of the calls that I did. Yeah. Yeah. Or just don't join the calls and let everybody else talk. You know, Basically, yeah. um, uh, the model is actually very similar to the way, you know, when I was doing stuff with the IETF, which is there were in-person meetings, those were high bandwidth conversations, but the rule was because not everyone could make it to the in-person meetings, any decision had to be ratified on the mailing list. Yeah. Um, and that's the only way yeah. to be yeah. So I, I would propose if we were going to do something like that um, with a video chat, yeah. So, so I have a actual ext4 technical question for you. Um, I've been looking at some of the shrinker implementations. Um, at, yeah, I've been looking at some of the shrinker implementations because there's a few, a few things in the shrinkers that actually need a, a to be reworked and made consistent. There's like MC, you know, MemCG integration and you know Numa awareness and things like that. And actually doing the integration of those things kind of deter, you know relies on the fact that we make all of the shrinkers uh, essentially Numa aware and MC, you know, MemCG aware. Um, so I was looking at uh, all the various shrinker implementations and came across a couple in ext4. Um, so like there's the, well, there's one for the, I think the MBK and there's also the extent list or the, yes. uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so my, Looking at them, they appear to have protection, you know, like they've got a single LRU list and spin lock protected. Um, to convert them to being uh, both Numa aware and MemCG aware, we have to convert them to list LRU. Um, do you see any problems with coming in and just doing a wholesale rewrite of the shrinkers for those to use the generic infrastructure and then, uh, you know, there's no longer global reclaim on those lists. It will be node-based reclaim or memcg-based reclaim. Is that, do you see any sort of problem with converting that from a global uh, LRU to uh, a bunch of smaller LRUs uh, that are independently uh, reclaimed from? I can't think of anything that would go wrong. I mean, this is probably not unique to any of the shrinkers, which is there are some of those uh, caches that have to be pinned in memory, so we end up skipping them, but that's not going to change the yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, in some cases, uh, we don't want memcg awareness. So, like for XFS, we've got the buffer cache shrinker, and that's global to the files. The buffer cache is global to the file system, and it's not uh, the actual objects in it aren't specific to any given memcg. Um, whereas I, I look at the like the extent cache there the extents are essentially per inode. So the memory that they're allocated from is probably being allocated from the MCG, the MemCG that is accessing that inode. And so it, it seems to me that maybe uh, it's not so much of a, a big deal to have MemCG aware reclaim of those. Yeah, I mean, it's the standard problem with you know, MemCG, which is you know, they may have been originally touched by one MemCG and it has gone away. It's actually Yeah, uh, some of that is actually already handled by the uh, list LRU, like the things like the memcg goes away, what do you do with the stuff that's left in the cache, um, or it's, you know, um, so the migration of those from where it was to, you know, parent, reparenting and stuff like that, that's already largely handled within the list LRU um, implementation, yeah. so, you know, I was just, you know, I, I like... I can't think Oh, all right, so so I'll, 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 you know, I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't about to step on a landmine. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, 
There may be a landmine, but I don't know about it. So, <laughs> so we'll both step on it. Exactly. <laughs> Like, is there any latest update on uh, parallel FSCK? No, there we go. Oh, now, oh, now it's really loud. All right. Um, yeah. So we, the person that we had who was working on parallel FSCK. Um, had gotten pulled off onto other projects, and so we don't currently have anyone working on parallel FSCK. So the current status is that the code to read in the bitmap in a parallel way has been in E2FS progs for a while, um, but everything else is, you know, on a branch which is actually pretty stale at this point and we'd probably have to um, get it pushed in. One of the reasons why uh, it hasn't been high priority is for some of the specific workloads that we were interested in, um, the improvements weren't large enough to really make it be worthwhile. And I think you may have noticed that when you were playing with it a little, which is there are some use cases where it did great and there were other um, file system you know, layouts basically where it didn't do a lot. Um, and so essentially it was one of those things where uh, you know, we would probably need to, you know, I think the parallel work that was done is useful, it's just not enough to really, uh, you know, move the needle for at least, uh, you know, some of the uh, use cases that we actually most cared about. And so, therefore, it got deprioritized. So, um, I, it would be great if someone was interested in picking it up, but at the moment, no one's working on it. Um, which is a little sad, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, because earlier when I kind of tried playing with it, I yeah. think the goal of us was to kind of rebase it and just see whether this is helping or not. But yeah, just wanted to check a status update on that. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the parallel bitmap reading certainly made diff a difference, right? I mean, that actually did help, uh, you know, some stuff. But it wasn't the big, let's read all the inode tables in parallel. Um, and so, yeah, it'd be nice if we could do more, but uh, that's not something that is actively being worked on. Um, but, you know, okay. that's probably the example of, you know, if anyone else is interested, we can probably, you know, get the patch stack available and someone else can play with it. Um, but that is the current status. <clears throat> All right, and I think, is Jan around or? No, I think he, yeah, he left. So I don't know, is there any other things people want to discuss vis-a-vis -vis EXD4? If not, I may be done. I, I can yeah. just kind of give yeah. a couple of updates. Mm -hmm. um, there is an atomic rights patch. I think um, most of it is done by John. Uh, but there is an interface pl plumbing that is happening for ext4 as well. Yep. Uh, for now, what we are doing is uh, getting uh, bigger lock and uh, for large large page size like 64k, mm -hmm. we, we can make the block size large enough so that we can support atomic rights. Uh, there is one other discussion that we are doing internally is like, can we make bigger lock something like a per file thing rather than the I mean, at that point of time, it will become something like an extend hint itself. But at this point of time, we have not thought through about the implementation detail. It's still under brainstorming. Yeah, I mean, I think if we wanted to do something like that, I think we should take a look at the XFS force align um, sort of mechanism because if we're going to do something like that, where instead of it being a file system attribute, it's a per file attribute, just simply out of consideration to users who want to use that feature, we probably want to align on concepts and ideally, you know, ioctals, exadder names, et cetera, right? So, 
just makes it easy for all the applications that actually want to use this is, you know, if we do as Ted just suggested, yeah. um, you know, the interfaces are already there. They just need to be plumbed in, you know, like the set attracts interfaces and all that. The information gets down to the XT4 already. Um, they just need, you just need to implement the extent size hint storage and that part of it and then plumb that into the allocator to do, you know, even on 4K block size stuff to just to do, like, if you've got a 16K extent <coughs> size hit, um, do the 16K allocation instead of the 4K allocation that you might have otherwise done. Yeah, and so, uh, like, where do you... St yeah, we can maybe discuss that offline as well, like, how is the implementation of, you know, yeah. per yeah. inode yeah. extent size hit? technical details, but, yeah, sure, I mean, sure. the, the, the interfaces that uh, the XFS code is using is already there, and partially plumbed into ext4 already so there should you know you, you shouldn't have to do any new um, user API work or anything of the sort like that yeah sure yeah and it turns out it'd be interesting if you're actually doing that because um, one uh, one particular use case that has recently come to my attention is people who are using a 4k page size and ext4 but have, who have decided to use the cheapest possible crappy EMMC with, where if you aren't doing 64K block sizes, the um, right endurance goes through the toilet. Uh, and they were actually asking like, you know, can we do something using, you know, 64K block sizes? Um, and so, yeah, so either that's like Louise's LBS stuff for uh, EXD4, or if we can at least make the data blocks be force aligned to 64K, um, it might help, right? Because this is basically, it's a cheap shit root file system on you know the crappiest EMMC EMM that they apparently could find. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> And then I think uh, there are patches from Zhang uh, on IOMAP conversion of data, you know, regular file path. Mm -hmm. I'm currently reviewing it and hopefully, I think once FS Verity changes are done, maybe ext4 can get that as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and that's that's probably one of the, yeah, I probably should have mentioned that, is the, the uh, IOMAP changes, which are RFC, you know, in an RFC state for buffered rights. Um, and the basic idea was to do it for the easy cases first, where the easy cases would be no, F no FS Verity, no FS Crypt, and no data equals journal mode, um, but at least get the easy stuff done. And then, you know, we would gradually convert stuff over. So we're certainly not blocked on FS Verity, FS Crypt support in IOMAP for buffered rights, but you know, if that's there, it's one less thing for us to actually do. Um, so yeah, that will probably be happening sometime this year, I would think. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That, uh, that's all. That's all. Yep. That. All right.